In this era of information superhighway, any individual, any community that lags behind in terms of digital literacy will be left behind. I think if you want to understand the challenges and the opportunities in Sub-Saharan Africa, you need to be talking to the stakeholders here, the governments here, the businesses here. Africa is a continent of hope. Welcome to GSMA Thrive Live in Conversation. This is a brand new interactive and impactful way to continue to connect the digital ecosystem by the GSMA. My name is Zara Chudri. I'm the Marketing Director for the GSMA Thrive Global Series of Virtual Events. And I'm genuinely excited to also be your host today. So over the next 40 minutes, our guest speakers will join us, streamed in from across the world, to discuss a topic which has never been more critical for our industries to delve into. We'll have the opportunity as we go to ask your questions just in the comment boxes in front of you. And at the end of the discussion, we'll give our speakers an opportunity to answer them. The conversation today um, is going to is a part of our GSMA Thrive Africa event, the virtual gathering where the future of Africa connects. And you can register for your free pass to jo join us at GSMA Thrive Africa on the URL now showing on the screen. Right, on with today's discussion. So as we unfortunately know, the COVID-19 pandemic has scarred the world. But perhaps the virus's most deadly symptom has been its, its ability to exacerbate the inequalities that already exist in our society. Now, as we are looking to rebuild and recover, we have an opportunity to not return to normal. Normal was broken. It was uninclusive, it was unequal. And this is a time now for public and private organizations to collaborate, and to build a better future together and build it faster. Joining us for this discussion today um, are our expert speakers, Akinwale Goodluck, Head of Sub-Saharan Africa um, at the GSMA, and Yolinda Jinzin Ma, a Digital Transformation Specialist at the United Nations Development Programme. Wale and Yolanda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. Great pleasure to be here. We are looking forward to a fantastic discussion. So I'm going to hand the screen over to you guys, and I'm going to see you at the end for our audience questions. Thank you very much, Zara. And good afternoon or good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to have all of you here and also let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Wale Goodluck. I'm head of the GSMA in Sub-Saharan Africa. The GSMA is the industry body for MNOs all over the world. And today we have about 750 mobile network operators who are members of the GSMA and also about another 300 companies involved or participating in the industry, stakeholders in the industry who are also members of the GSMA. The mobile industry has been particularly interested in the United Nations Development Program um, um, development goals. The GSMA led the industry in 2016 to be the first to adopt the development goals. And as of today, the pandemic has demonstrated how fundamental digital technologies are to societies and economies everywhere. It has brought new awareness of the power and potential of a digitally enabled world. And today with more than 5 billion individuals using a mobile phone and almost half a billion are in Sub-Saharan Africa, the reach of mobile technology remains unparalleled. The technology provides individuals an unrivaled platform to access essential communications and life enhancing services. With more and more people using mobile every year, the industry continues to increase its impact on all 17 SDGs. However, we still got quite a long way to go. With 10 years left to achieve the 2030 SDG targets, it's incumbent on the mobile industry, policymakers, and the wider ecosystem to act faster to maximize mobile's potential within the next decade. As at the end of September, um, during the United Nations General Assembly Week, the GSMA will publish its SDG Industry Impact Report. 
I invite all of you to keep an eye for this report, which measures our industry progress against the 17 SDGs. It's my pleasure to introduce Yolanda. Yolanda is a digital transformation specialist at the UNDP, and she's very passionate about the potential for digital innovation to drive digital inclusiveness. Yolanda, maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit about yourself and also a little bit about the UNDP and the SDGs. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Ale, and thank you for the kind introduction and for setting the background, um, the context. And hi, everyone. Um, as uh, Wale introduced, I'm from the United Nations Development Program, as UN's development agency, and we're working more than um, 170 countries and territories. UNDP works across a wider range of uh, programs addressing some of the toughest global development challenges like climate change, poverty, and inequalities. And the team I'm part of is led by the Chief Digital Officer and the first and probably the only one in the UN system, actually. As my title indicates, digital transformation, not only for UNDP, but also supporting the digital journey of governments and countries we work with. So it's a real honor to be here today to share with you some of our work and observations. So around the SDGs, just for those who, um, who are not familiar, I believe many of you um, have heard of it or know something about it, but for those who doesn't know what this little SDG ring means, um, this, is, this is a set of uh, goals and the full name is called 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and it's a framework that we use to bring everyone together. And in such a challenging time, as Wale has introduced, it is really a moment of disruption. So more than ever, we need to synchronize our common goals between all the stakeholders. And so that's why we really need SDGs to bring us together. So it is a plan of action for people, planet, and prosperity. Um, and there are 17 goals or SDGs in short that aims to have no one left behind. And there are some enabling factors that would either accelerate or hinder the achievement of SDGs and internet access being one of them. And I believe we will get into some more details of the, of the topic for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Uh, that was a great introduction and thanks for you know, also setting the tone and helping to drive the conversations that we're going to have this afternoon. Like everything, the world has changed. Um, COVID-19 has impacted everything. Uh, in most cases, it has been negative. And, you know, what impact does this have for the 2030 agenda? Yeah, indeed. With the challenges at that scale, that's almost without precedent. The world is actually off track in achieving the 2030 agenda, let's be honest. Um, so UNDP has been doing an annual human development report, which is measuring not only the economic development, um, but also education, health, and living standards of the world. So according to our latest research, um, actually for the first time since 1990, we're witnessing the global reverse of human development, and that is shocking, um, but not really surprising. So. As the world is turning to the digital solutions to fight for the pandemic, it has also brought disadvantages of those unconnected into really stark relief. And just to bring some basic numbers here, um, and I know Wally, we're going to discuss more about the actual digital divide later, um, but just some basic numbers here. Well, many of us are enjoying this online conversation like this one, or we're studying, working, shopping online, we need to remember almost half of the world's population has no access to internet at all. And this pandemic brought up their really disadvantages even to even, even more obvious. So that is a estimated 3.6 billion people and primarily in developing countries have no access to reliable internet. So that is the digital divide we're facing and it is a huge gap and they are making their life really tough, um, especially during the, during the pandemic. So um, while we face this vulnerable population, internet access is not enough and we need to do more to make, make, it, make their life easier and to fight the pandemics, to access the reliable information. Um, so let me share some of the um, 
examples that UNDP has been doing to help this population, but also helping countries in general during this during the special time. Um, so in the past few months, ever since COVID hit, we have been working with governments and local innovators globally to fight against COVID-19. And we really witnessed a surge of demand for digital. So in some countries, while the situation is more basic, we tackle the median needs. So for example, in Azerbaijan, Senegal, Uganda, Sudan, we support the governments with their basic ICT equipment, teleconferencing facilities, so they can continue their work. And sometimes we need to also train the government officials to help them to serve their citizens online. Let's be honest, many of the governments are doing this for the first time and they're not exactly sure what to do. And in some countries, such as Uganda, Namibia, we work with the leading e-commerce companies there to connect over 2,000 informal product sellers to customers um, when where there are a little bit more advanced um, e-commerce systems. And in some countries, while they have more longer term um, systematic transformation plans, we work with them to, to develop their digital strategy or enhance their data ecosystem so they could um, work towards a more longer term and national strategy to fight for a longer socioeconomic recovery. The, the point is we need to not only get back to where we were before, but also back onto the trajectory where people can stay hopeful for their future. And so in this whole process, I've been talking about our observation of, of our work, of our um, work with the government, um, but we're also seeing incredibly fast and life-changing innovations from across across the world, but also in particularly in Africa, actually, um, especially from technology companies, from the local entrepreneurs. And Wally, I know you have been working very closely with those many organizations and individuals on digital innovation. Do you want to share some stories with us um, of their achievements, how they've been doing, and maybe some of the challenges as well? Yes, Yolanda, thank you very much. Indeed, the GSMA, I think, has been at the forefront of helping innovators, entrepreneurs work with the mobile network operators in sub-Saharan Africa with a view to building synergies between innovators and mobile operators. Um, the ultimate objective is to scale innovative and sustainable mobile services in emerging, emerging markets with full appreciation that there are, there are an increasing number of mobile products and services in emerging markets, but reaching scale and delivering relevant services within the context of the concerns and challenges that we have in sub-Saharan Africa, I think has been the, the sort of the biggest challenge. Um, we've got literacy issues in sub-Saharan Africa, we've got coverage issues, we've got trust issues with technology. So innovators and entrepreneurs in sub-Saharan Africa have had to work around all this. And I think that COVID-19 has brought out the best of our people in sub-Saharan Africa. If I look at one area that Africa is really impacted is around the area of education. Before COVID-19, globally, we had about 260 million children and youths out of school, and 89% of children in low-income countries fall into what the World Bank classifies as learning poverty. These are children who are, by the age of 10, are really typically unable to understand a simple text or read a simple text. Um, We've seen a lot of companies in the ed tech space um, doing wonderful things. They have taken into consideration the challenges here. Um, I like to talk about ENISA education. And you know, one good thing about ENISA is that ENISA is also a GSMA Ecosystem Accelerator Innovation Fund grantee. Uh, ENISA provides a subscription service for educational content to children in primary and secondary schools via SMS or USSD and allows them to pay either daily, weekly, or monthly. Uh, ENISA is active, for instance, in Kenya, in Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire. What is interesting about the solution from ENISA, one, is that it's not internet dependent, it's not smartphone dependent, and it doesn't come with barriers in terms of contracts of subscriptions. So you can pay daily, it recognizes the 
um, income pattern of a lot of people in sub-Saharan Africa, and it addresses these things. I think also we saw Eniza in April uh, work with Safaricom to provide free access to educational content. Another area that I think is really interesting is where what we've seen in terms of agriculture and the ability of smallhold farmers to sell their products through online channels, to bypass intermediaries, and this leads to improved income for the farmers, reduces wastage, and ensures that customers are getting fresher produce. The majority of people in Sub-Saharan Africa are employed in the agriculture chain, and this no doubt has contributed a lot. Again, we have another GSMA grantee, AgroCenter, which has established an online platform that connects smallholder farmers. And essentially, we're looking at the staples. We're looking at rice. We're looking at maize, millet, soybean, uh, this value chain, and introducing them to a wider online market, helping with truck delivery services, and also supporting, the industry is also supporting with a payment platform, uh, mobile money in a lot of countries, which again addresses the issues that we have in Sub-Saharan Africa and helps to address those things and ensures that you know, people can get money, they can pay, they can transact, and all within a safe, transparent, and accountable environment without a need for reducing a need for face-to-face -face transactions. Again, you know, this has helped um, with responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. I think lastly, I also like to talk about some other work that is going on by AgroCenter. They have developed a platform called Sentinel. And what Sentinel does again is that it disseminates information, but you know, we can say, well, look, there are loads of people doing this already, but Sentinel has brought in uh, an African solution to an African problem. It is, first of all, it has helped to jump the literacy barrier by bringing IVR, so it's interactive voice response that works on feature phones, so, and it's also in local languages. So this really you know, addresses the need of those who need it. It provides information on health, um, education, um, things to do when you contact COVID, and you know, this has proven extremely useful in a lot of our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, th those are super interesting examples. And uh, actually, they reminded me of uh, um, when I mentioned um, UNDP has been collecting the country examples. Actually, one of the observations is there is less like high tech technology solutions. Like there's not many AI or blockchain solutions. Um, well, we talk about COVID-19 um, digital solutions, but actually many of them are low tech. Like you said, no smartphone, even no internet. Um, so you can use that offline um, with limited data. Um, and that is the interesting observation. And, and we believe that's, uh, and we see a lot um, actually used on mobile apps, like you mentioned. Um, so actually many of them are um, building on those kind of uh, um, less smartphones. Um, I think that shows that actually many in developing countries, those solutions are really innovations um, um, thanks to the benefiting from the mobile penetration. So, um, but I wonder, um, do you wanna touch a little bit more on the, what are the other usage gaps, um, especially in Africa, but also maybe globally as well. Um, you mentioned about some of them already, like the payment transaction kind of the user barriers. You mentioned about the content side of things. Are there any other um, usage gaps that you witness in Africa? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Yolanda. I think COVID-19 has really brought this to the fore for us in Sub-Saharan Africa. It has helped us to see in Sub-Saharan Africa that the problem may not necessarily be coverage, but the issue for us in Sub-Saharan Africa now is bridging the usage gap. The usage gap is that we have a lot of people in Sub-Saharan Africa who are covered by either a 3G or 4G network, but they are not connected to the internet. For us to see the kind of digital economy that we're all talking about, to see a digital economy that will translate into jobs, that will lift people out of poverty, that will be inclusive, we have to close the usage gap. We have to get people online in sub-Saharan Africa. We have to fill the pipes. 
And when you look at Sub-Saharan Africa today, what are those barriers? Um, Af digital literacy is a major barrier for a lot of people. And I know that you know the UNDP, the GSMA, and the mobile industry, uh, policymakers and regulators are all working to address uh, the issues around digital literacy. Um, this way, and we say we're beginning to yield more and more results, and more and more people will understand the need to go online and how to go online. We also know that affordability is a problem, both in terms of affordability of devices, affordability of data bundles. I think there's also a lot of work going on to address this now. There are initiatives by operators, by the GSMA, and by several governments across Sub-Saharan Africa on how to deliver perhaps a sub-$20 smartphone. Um, there's a lot of work in terms of how can we make data bundles more affordable. And I think if you look at the trajectory across Sub-Saharan Africa, the MNOs working with governments and regulators have done a good job in terms of making data available at reasonable prices for consumers. So that I think is headed in the right direction. A big problem also is around local content, it's about relevant content. A lot of the material online is either in English or in French. Um, we need to see more uh, material in the local languages. We need to find materials that provide or offer a compelling reason for people in sub-Saharan Africa to come online. We need a compelling reason for the people who really need the empowerment the most to come online. Today, most of them don't see a reason to come online. Uh, data does not give perhaps the immediate value like voice did a decade or two decades ago, but there's a lot of work now. Uh, governments are looking at how to align their broadband uh, plans. And aside from this supply side, they're also beginning to invest in the demand side. Um, I've seen some of the governments in Africa do this very, very well. Um, there's a lot of work going on in Nigeria. There's a lot of work going on in Kenya. There's a lot of work going on in South Africa to make the internet uh, more appealing and to get people to come online. Um, coverage is still a problem for a lot of people, but it's not as much as we had. Um, today in Sub-Saharan Africa, most, a lot of people are covered by 3G or 4G network. So therein, Yolanda, I think, is a brief summary of where the usage gap is today and what we need to do to address it. Great, thank you, Ali. Um, and just to echo what you already said, um, we, we also, in our work, we've, we've observed how those barriers are and we're also working with the governments to address some of that. And let me give a little bit more examples to um, some of the barriers you mentioned, um, but maybe at the more global level, a um, little bit um, beyond Africa itself. Um, so for the content problem that you mentioned, indeed, um, in many of the developing countries, especially, um, I think during COVID, uh, when we talk about content, it's, um, it's more specifically we're talking about how to access the reliable information um, about COVID. And that actually is a big problem for many of the governments and to, to deliver the information to their citizens if they don't have the internet, right? Um, so um, one example um, in, in Asia, Asia Pacific, we actually build the online chatbots to share those reliable information to, to the users um, who are young and energetic, who have access to internet, and so on the social media platform that we have um, for accessing the youth in Africa, uh, in Asia Pacific, there are 200,000 followers. So through them, then they can access the, their families and their elderly at home. And actually that leads to the literacy and capability. There's apparently a generation gap, um, like the elderly are not necessarily very good at using mobile or using or getting online. So in India, for example, we're sending youth to train the elderly at home of how to use their mobile phones. So this is an easy trick, but really can, can help bridging the generation gap. Um, and also want to touch on the culture side, you mentioned about the payment and the transaction. And I think in some ways the crisis actually addressed the barrier itself. So it's actually creating that user behavior that may not exist before. And we've seen that across the globe as well not just in Africa, but elsewhere. Um, 
that the whole um, that the behavior about getting more used to digital payment and that will pave the way for future development as well. Um, and I also want to mention a couple of things that, that you, you haven't mentioned um, yet, um, which we see are also important. One of them is digital privacy and security. Now that everyone's online and some of us might have already got some uh, um, online hacks through our online meetings. Um, so that is actually some literacy and capability um, awareness training needs to be done. And we see that um, important to help protect our users. Um, and also um, in terms of the affordability, um, we see that um, in, in some mobile operators, um, you would know that they're actually offering free access to the, to the official COVID-19 website. So no data is required. So that kind of is connected to the content problems. Many of the, these barriers and solutions as we observe actually really connected, interconnected, and we need to address them not like one by one, but really as an ecosystem. And finally, I want to touch on the more toughest and, um, and problems or challenges that we are still figuring out how to address, which is the financing. And you mentioned the scaling at the very beginning. Um, and those for us, we see that as one of the toughest problems and challenges to address. So earlier um, this year, we did a report with the Euro Europe Investment Bank. Basically, the idea is to find the best solutions in Africa, the digital solutions in Africa for fighting COVID-19. And through those to see, have an estimate of what are the investments actually needed to scale those solutions, not only nationally, but also regionally. So that actually proved to be quite difficult. Um, and, and to also look at that not only as an immediate solution, but also broader and longer um, scaling and financing for the, for the infrastructure and also for the more enabling environment. So those are the few um, to add on to what we discussed about usage gap, how to bridge that gap. And I think that brought us um, very naturally to the next topic around how we can actually um, build better digital economy. And you already mentioned the need for better jobs, um, for better content, um, for literacy. And um, so just on the, on the digital economy, we've been actually witnessing um, some of the uh, some of the interesting innovations, um, let me also share share one of the examples um, outside of the, outside of Africa as well, and to also add some hope for future. And not all these like tackling any of these barriers we talked before really require investment, require lots of effort, um, and there is a return of investment. Let's be honest. Um, and so let me share one example in Bangladesh. Um, so there we've been working for decades around a um, access to information. The, that's the name of the program called Access to Information. And we've been working on that for 10 years. Started with a really building very basic internet centers um, and brought the, the, the connectivity to 40% around five years ago. And ever since then, we've been working with the government to reduce the cost of the internet. And so when the COVID actually hit, um, all of that kind of uh, building on that infrastructure that we've been building, um, put on that foundation. Um, the team actually trained over 4,000 doctors to provide the telemedicine service through a national hotline that has served over 350,000 patients. So that's in Bangladesh and at that scale, um, that's not imaginable if there's no basic structure already set up. And, and the way we paved um, for the past decade, kind of having the return now. So that hopefully provides some hope for some of the African countries were at, at the starting point where the nation might be 10 years before. Um, so that brought us to, so with that example in mind, um, let, me, let me kind of bring it back to the digital economy and what it actually requires for different stakeholders to actually work on. Well, you already mentioned some of that. And for us, we see it really needs different stakeholders to work together and requires the government to really pursue the policy change to provide the enabling environment to drive for the structural transformation. And this is the opportunity now. And it requires the business and entrepreneurs to drive the innovation, drive leverage technology. And you shared some of the very good examples. And we all, we've also seen some of the um, great innovations up there. And, and 
lastly but not least, it requires the global community and development partners to really aim for the long-term planning um, and for the better and socioeconomic recovery. So in short, um, the crisis really kind of pushed us to reimagine the future, especially in health, education, employment, but to realize that it really takes leadership, imagination, and collaboration. That's why we're here and talking about this topic. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting to see the trajectory that we're seeing in sub-Saharan Africa, where a lot of governments are beginning to see the need to bundle the Ministry of ICT and the drive for digital economy together. So we're seeing a trend where more and more ministers for ICT or for communications are also being charged with the digital economy. Uh, I think that this is a really good and positive trend for us in sub-Saharan Africa. Again, we're, you know, we're seeing this in a lot of the big uh, economies in sub-Saharan Africa, and this we are confident will help to drive growth and help us to achieve that digital economy that we're talking about that will create jobs, bring enablement, etc. Yolanda, um, you know, maybe one more question from me to you is where do we go from here? How can our communities to work together, continue to work together? Great, thank you, Ali. And using this last chance, I think, um, I think again, um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, having the connectivity is not enough. Um, and we all agree that, um, and there are, for, for UNDP, what we really care about is the inclusivity. So that goes back to the topic of the of the our conversation here is inclusive development, and let's never forget about those who are really vulnerable in this context: those the women, the children, the elderly, the people with disabilities, um, people in crisis countries, immigrants, refugees, unbanked population, um, and how can we serve? these um, vulnerable and underserved communities is what we really care about. And this is what we really work with JSMA and, and the members in your ecosystem as well. And so for that, um, I think this is really an opportunity to really bring together all the actors to really serve that community and that um, population. Um, so we need, we need private sector um, to step in. We need private sector and public to public sector to work together. Governments are cannot be and will not be the only actor in this space, and we have to work together um, to address these really tough problems that need need more investment and need more resources and need more dedication than ever. And that is why uh, we're partnering with JSMA on this Thrive Africa as event partner. And our Chief Digital Officer Robert Up will participate in the Policy Leader Forum, forum later um, to discuss the digital for development. And he can share a little bit more examples in the space. Uh, and we also will join some of the thematic tracks um, and to complement the contributions coming from private sector and government partners that Jensen will be very proudly um, bringing together. So um, I really appreciate Jensen providing this platform and I hope we will all work together to connect, to collaborate, and leaving no one offline and leaving no one behind. Thank you, Ali. Thank you very, very much, Yolanda. Um, I think that we both are really committed to digital inclusivity for everybody. There's a misconception in a lot of corridors in Sub-Saharan Africa that, oh, everybody in Sub-Saharan Africa has a phone, everybody's online, but we all know that that is not true. We need to do all that we can to bring the common man, the disadvantaged, the excluded, to bring them online. And you know, you've mentioned the, the, the building blocks. We need to put in a financial system like mobile money that helps inclusivity. We need to make everybody digitally literate, digitally included. And you know, our challenges have never been more complex than they are now. Connectivity has never been more important. And COVID-19 has really brought this to the fore. And one thing that I know is certain is that we are all in this together. The GSMA is honored to continue to build bridges in times of need. Um, later this month, technology innovators, digital creators, and policy leaders will gather together at GSMA Thrive 
for us to talk about all these things, propose solutions, and how to implement and take things forward. We're really honored to work with UNDP as partners of Thrive Africa, along with our founding partners, MasterCard, MTN, Orange, and ZTE. It's my pleasure to invite our audience here to head to the website now and register for your complimentary access to this digital experience and continue the conversation with us here. We look forward to seeing you all on the 29th of September, 2020. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Yolanda. And what a, what a fantastic discussion, a massive topic, but I think for the last 40 minutes, you've, you've given us a really beautiful overview of, of actually what's happening now and what's next. So while you were talking, we had comments from all around the world uh, of people kind of joining in and putting their questions in, which has been brilliant. So, so thank you to our audience for participating. Um, we have a few minutes, so I'd love to share some of these questions with you and get your, your thoughts on them. Um, so the first one, and this is, this is um, aimed at, at, bo at both yourselves. How is your work addressing the needs of people with disabilities in the digital space across, across Sub-Saharan Africa? Um, Yolanda, maybe if you'd like to take this one first. Um, thank you, Zara. Um, that's a good question. And I actually mentioned about people with disabilities um, in, my, in my last part as well. Um, one, one immediate example coming in mind, I'm um, not really very necessarily COVID related, um, but we've been actually, uh, but, but it's in the digital space. We've been using 3D printing to print the prosthesis to, pro to produce the low cost, um, kind of uh, providing low cost products on the market that may not necessarily accessible for those with disabilities and with uh, um, poor conditions. That's one example come to mind. Um, I don't know, Wale, if you have any um, other innovations from the, from the market or from the, from the private sector to share. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Um, for us at the GSMA, addressing people with living with people living with disability is key and fundamental. We've got a program that actually is focused on that. And recently we also set up a fund, um, an innovation fund for people to come up with solutions for people living with disability, um, solutions that we can scale and deploy across sub-Saharan Africa. So it's top of mind for us at the GSMA. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we had a few questions coming in around payments uh, as well, which I'd like to, to, put, to put to both of you. So one of the questions here is looking at digital payments specifically. Um, it'd be good to get your thoughts on what are the key strategies needed to make payments affordable so that people can actually minimize the use of cash. Wale, maybe you'd like to take that one first. Uh, absolutely. I think that Africa, have, and particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, has demonstrated what you can achieve with mobile money. If mobile money is deployed with the right um, policy and regulatory support, it can really, really cross the divide and bring people, um, make people financially included. If you look at the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that have very high financial inclusion ratios, you will find that they also have very high mobile penetration ratios. So we're seeing, of course, Kenya is the leader in Sub-Saharan Africa, but we're also seeing really, really good growth driven by good policies in Ghana, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Tanzania, Zambia, you know, we're seeing a lot of work, but you know, again, we mustn't get too carried away about the success that we have achieved with mobile money in the region. There is need for us to continue to drive it with proper policies. And, you know, there's a growing trend in the region now. I think as more and more people see the growth of mobile money, it has become the subject of taxation and levies. And some of these new pronouncements have a negative impact on financial inclusion because we don't want people to go back to cash under the bed anymore. Yeah, I just want to add um, that digital payment is again it's a it's a it's opportunity and challenge that needs the ecosystem to work together. And um, one of the links showed earlier, um, the digital financing task force is actually one of the um, yeah, and here it is. It is one of the um, 
one of the efforts led by the Secretary General of the United Nations to really bring together all the different actors and actually both the director of GSMA and our administrator are part of this group and they're members of this group. And the report actually was just launched. So go to the link to check out the latest report. It's really talking about how we could leverage the ecosystem and leverage people's money, how we could bring together all the different actors, including the, the individual citizens to really um, work together and financing not only um, the, the basic needs, but also for the sustainable development of the future. Brilliant, fantastic. Um, and then we've been hearing a lot about, we've been speaking a lot about build, you know, in our recovery process, building resilience. Um, one of the questions that we've had submitted, which I think is a, is a fantastic one is, how does your work, and again, to both GSMA and UNDP, um, how do you, uh, how, are you, how is your work contributing to the resilience of vulnerable communities in Africa? Um, and Yolanda, maybe if you'd like to say this one first. Sorry, just to make sure I get the question. It's for resilience of uh, one of the communities. Vulnerable, vulnerable communities. Oh, yeah. vulnerable communities. Yeah, sure. Um, I think um, we've uh, talked about a little bit around the digital economy, um, but didn't get into much details. So. Um, the, the informal sector is really a big part of Africa, as I understand, and while you might actually have more numbers there, and and they are really hit hard, um, not only in Africa, but also globally, right? Um, so, and and I think the latest number there is also women are a larger part of that, and they're hit even harder. Um, so, in, in I think in Uganda, uh, sorry, in, yeah, in Uganda and Namibia, we actually work with the, some of the digital platforms. So basically what we did is we see that these women and these informal sectors, they are hit hard, they lost their jobs, they don't have their vendors on the street anymore, and they have nowhere to sell their products. So um, what we did is kind of uh, train them, get them online first and give them the right skills to and work with the digital platforms to connect them. So one of the private sector we work with is Jumia, which is one of the biggest e-commerce platform in Africa, um, to connect them with the platform so that they, they know how to sell their products online. And by doing that, we're giving them the access to their customers and to their, to their financing as well, so that they don't need to rely on their original stores or their original um, products anymore. Brilliant, thank you. Unfortunately, that does bring us to the end of our time today. Um, but Yolanda and Wale, thank you so much. Thank you for the incredibly um, in insightful discussion. Um, and thank you to our audience as well for joining us again. Um, it has been absolutely fantastic to see what a global range of people we've had uh, live uh, join our live stream today. So Wale and the team at UNDP are going to be joining us on screen again uh, in a few weeks' time at the GSMA Thrive Africa event, along with 70 other speakers for a packed three-day agenda it's kicking off on the 29th of September. The URL um, is going to come up on screen now. And just a reminder, you can register for free for this event um, just following this link. So before I leave you with an exclusive look at our trailer, um, all that is left uh, for me to say is a thank you again. Um, stay safe, stay innovating, and see you at GSMA Thrive Africa. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, everyone. In this era of uh, information superhighway, any individual, any individual, any community that lags behind in digital terms literacy. of digital literacy will be left behind. The GSMA conference presence in Africa demonstrates that we have great products and innovations that are coming from the continent, from local Africans. Industry continues to grow, operator revenues continue to grow, the industry remains a key employer in the region. Digital citizenship is a right that we all all the Africans. There's a need for us as African governments to collaborate and ensure integration of the continent. 
needs to be here so that we can meet here as Africans and speak about issues that pertain to us and how we can tackle them. I think if you want to understand the challenges and the opportunities in Sub-Saharan Africa, you need to be talking to the stakeholders here, the governments here, the businesses here. Because most of the markets are saturated, Africa is a continent of hope. Africa is waking up to the new reality that we need to come together, you know, as a continent and work to make things really better for all of us.